Good morning and welcome to today's webinar, Managing Dementia-Related Changes in Behavior and Personality. We thank you for being here. These complimentary webinars are brought to you through a collaboration with our sponsors. We have O'Connor Mortuary, Care Choice Hospice and Palliative Services, Caring Companions at Home, Chatterton and Associates, the Wealth Management Team, and of course, Alzheimer's Orange County. And I am Kim Bailey, and I'm with Alzheimer's Orange County, and I add my warm welcome to you. Our sponsors are providing these webinars as a service to the community on topics that are beneficial for anyone uh, who cares professionally or personally uh, for older adults. And we hope that you find them informative and useful. We are so pleased to have Dr. Miriam Galinda with us today, and I'll tell you a little bit about her, but first take a look at this slide, which uh, we share our collaborators, uh, collaborators and uh, make our acknowledgments, so take a quick look there at others who are supporting this lecture today. And then we'll go to the next slide so that I can brag a little bit about uh, Dr. Galindo. Dr. Galindo is a licensed psychologist, social worker, and a nurse. So I call her a triple threat. <laughs> she has over 30 years experience working across a variety of outpatient and inpatient mental health settings. She's also a former long-term uh, caregiver for her late father, Henry. Uh, who was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. She shares a practice, private practice, with her husband, Dr. Jorge Galindo, and I'm so pleased to say she's been a proud and very valued volunteer for Alzheimer's Orange County since uh, 2016. So uh, before I turn it over to her, I want to remind everyone that they will be on mute throughout the course of the discussion of the uh, dialogue today. However, as we go along today, you'll have an opportunity to ask questions by placing your questions into the chat box. And then when we get to the end of her talk, we're going to have a little Q&A and uh, I'll be uh, managing that Q&A with Dr. Galindo. So even though you're on mute, you do have an opportunity to um, participate in an interactive way a little bit later on. And so um, with that, I think we'll go ahead and turn this over to our very esteemed speaker, Dr. Miriam Galindo. Thank you, Kim. Good morning, everyone. My name is Dr. Galindo, and can I tell you, it's such an honor to be your facilitator today. Today's topic is one of my absolute favorites because it really gives those of us who are caregivers this profound opportunity to enter into the world of our loved ones and meet them where they are. And you know what I've found is that's the irony of this disease. It pulls from us caregivers a level of love we just never knew was possible. At least that's been my experience. And also a level of creativity and ingenuity I never knew was possible. I'm hoping you're noticing that as well. I just want to share a couple of words of appreciation for those of you who are working professionally with people with dementia. I want to thank you for your uh, taking the time today to tune in to learn something new. Um, as somebody who knows both sides, never underestimate how much your kind acts and your willingness to be there means your clients and their families. And for those who are family members, thank you for devoting yourself to your loved ones. What a gift you are, more precious than gold. And for all of you, if we at Alzheimer's Orange County achieve nothing more today, I hope that you can leave this webinar with a renewed sense of hope. You're not alone in this journey. I want you to know that. And we at Alzheimer's Orange County are wanting so much to walk alongside of you. So let's move on to what we're gonna talk about today. So to start with, let's talk about the objectives. By the end of this presentation, you will understand why persons with dementia exhibit changes in personality and behaviors. You will find out what you can do to address the challenges. In other words, add more tools to your toolbox. And you will figure out how to handle 
your own reactions. So as we discuss tools in your toolbox, please keep this in mind. Light can't come from an empty lantern. You need to fuel up so that your light shines brightly. What that fuel is is going to be different for different people, right? Joy is wrapped in different packages. Um, and I, I think as you look at the slide, one universal source of fuel is something as simple as deep breathing, right? Four deep breaths, four times a day. Doing that will successfully override your body's stress response so that you can stay on course. Because remember, this journey is not just a sprint, it's a long distance run. So let's talk about the definition of dementia. What is dementia? Well, dementia is an umbrella term under which there are 120 different types. It's not a normal part of the aging process. For each subtype, there may be a different etiology or a contributing factor, different manifestations, different associated factors, a different progression. Certainly, there are dementias that stand still, or at least seem to stand still, like vascular type dementia. In those types, you might have an abrupt change, but they don't necessarily progress, at least for a while. But for most dementias, there's a chronic, progressive, irreversible, and ultimately fatal outcome. Bottom line, it's not just a memory loss, and that's the important thing to keep in mind. It's incremental brain damage over time. For example, an Alzheimer's type of dementia, which is the most common type, amyloid plaques and neurofibrillate tangles infiltrate the brain, creating a toxic environment, which kills off brain cells one by one. The plaques and tangles accumulate decades before symptoms actually become obvious. And at some point, the sheer accumulation of these substances leads to outward signs. When these substances override the hippocampus, short-term memory loss occurs. And then it moves through to the frontal lobes, resulting in the loss of executive and organizational abilities. And it progresses to the language centers of the brain, resulting in a loss of receptive and expressive language. And into the occipital lobes, which is in the back of the brain, and that affects visual and spatial interpretation. And then into the very, very back of the brain, which is called the cerebellum, which affects balance and coordination. And then into the brain stem, which is responsible for breathing and heart rate. And here you can see that brain that I described. The red portion is that frontal lobe, and that's what's responsible for organization and executive functioning. So what we can take away from this is because of this brain damage, a person with Alzheimer's is going to show some signs and changes in behavior. And these are the signs we often see as outward observers. So when you see your loved one becoming agitated or getting lost or worrying excessively or refusing medication, sleeping problems, uh, paranoia, becoming confused, repeating self, seeing and hear, hearing things, these are corresponding with the parts of the brain that are responsible and the parts of the brain responsible for these things is damage. So what we're seeing is outward manifestations of damage. And that's important for our care, us caregivers to keep in mind. So the takeaway for us caregivers is this. Your loved one is trying to communicate something with these outward manifestations of behavior. But they're up against a brain that's playing tricks on them. The brain is jumbling their words, jumbling your words, distorting their ability to interpret the world around them. Things aren't making sense to them. In fact, nothing is what it seems. 
So they might be communicating something like they're feeling sick, they're injured, something hurts, they're frustrated, they're sad, they're afraid. That actually uh, underlies a lot of behaviors, by the way. And yet they can't seem to get that across to those of us around them. Imagine how frightening that would be. Behaviors are generally not done to annoy you. They're not done due to poor listening and they're not done on purpose. Your loved one is doing the best they can with the brain matter that they have. A good rule of thumb for us caregivers is when you're trying to figure out what they're trying to communicate to you, rule out the physical causes first, and then you can consider other triggers in the environment, um, inclu including the psychosocial factors, right? So if your loved one exhibits especially an abrupt shift in behavior, with more confusion or agitation than usual, the source might be a serious infection. So call your doctor. Once you rule out that there's no medical cause, then we can move on uh, to other um, uh, triggers in the environment and maybe even from within. So the way we approach a problem then is to try to do it in a very uh, objective and scientific manner. And the way I try to teach this is to break it down in this with this acrostic, the IDEA approach, I-D-E-A. So the acrostic, I-D, let me pull up all of these so you can see. The acrostic, I-D-E-A, can be broken down like this. The first step is identify the behavior. The second step, explore the meaning. And the third, to adjust. And by this, I mean, um, be very, very specific initially as you're identifying the behavior. Be as objective as possible to simply say what's going on. Once you do that, then you can explore the possible meanings and causes. And at this point, you try to think of everything under the sun that could possibly be contributing to the behavior. And you try very hard to look at these things through the eyes of your loved one. And then finally, you adjust either the environment or yourself. So let's just go through each one of these. First step, when you identify the behavior, try to describe it. What is it? And you don't put any values on that behavior, don't put any judgments. You even try to el elicit opinions from other people who might see it, just to see if you're seeing it the same way as other people. And also to find out, does it bother anybody else? Maybe you're the only one that it bothers. Second, when you're exploring the behavior, again, you wanna see it through the eyes of your loved one. What meaning does this behavior have for this person? What's this person trying to say to you? Because with every behavior, it's not random. They're trying to communicate something. And it's really up to us to be very good detectives about figuring out what that is. And then finally, for step three, in adjusting, again, like I said before, there's only two things you can adjust. This person that you love so much is trying the best they can with what they've got. They can't change, and your efforts to change them are not going to do much but agitate or upset, right? So the only two things left are to change the environment or and change your attitude. And I would say try to change the environment first before you decide that the only thing left is to change your attitude. So now we're going to try this acrostic, this scientific approach to figuring out what's going on. This approach that slows down the thinking process so that you're not just jumping to conclusions and randomly trying to, you know, see what sticks and, and uh, come up with a conclusion. 
So the idea approach is going to be applied now to some scenarios. And I'm going to read the scenarios, and you're going to be thinking about what's happening here, what might be causing the behavior, what does the behavior mean to this individual as I look at the surroundings through their eyes, and then how would I respond? So the first scenario involves hallucinations. This is a common problem with a common response. And I'm going to start with the common problem, with the common response. We're going to talk about what happened, apply the acrostic, and then we're going to come up with a, a good solution. So in this scenario, a caregiver has just helped her mother lie down to sleep for the night. Minutes later, her mother bolts out the room, expressing fear about an evil man in my room. The caregiver dismisses mother's concerns, flips on the lights, and tells mother to go back to bed. Look, there's nobody here. Visibly frustrated, the caregiver helps her mother back into bed, turns out the light, and closes the door. So... Here we've got a scenario, and I want you to apply this acrostic. What do you think is happening? What may be causing the behavior? What does the behavior mean to the person? And how would you respond? So let's start with identifying the behavior. Well, in this scenario, the mother is running out of her room, stating that there's an evil man in the room. She's expressing fear. So do you see, I just reiterated the facts. I didn't apply any judgment. I didn't make any value association with this. And I certainly didn't at this point ascribe any meaning. I simply stated the facts. The next step, explore. In this scenario, we look at the world through the eyes of the mother, through her brain. So the best thing this caregiver could do is go back into the room with the lights off and look around. And in this case, we might see if we do that, that the coat rack is casting a shadow in the wall. To the mother, it could very much look like an evil man is in her room. So see, once we figure out what the problem is, as we look through the eyes of our loved one, the answer just arises through the problem. We already know now what to adjust. And that is to remove the coat rack because the coat rack is the offender, right? Or at least part of it. So the first thing we can do is adjust the environment. So that would mean removing the object, casting the shadow. And then we could also change our attitude. Instead of responding so abruptly, we can take the time to listen recognize there must be a really good reason that she's so fearful because the fear is genuine and then offer something comforting like a blanket or a hug or one of the most profoundly helpful things to do is touch eye contact a smile so let's apply this here's an improved response to a hallucination the caregiver tries to see the environment through her mother's eyes Number two, in walking in with the lights off and looking at it through her mother's eyes, she realizes the coat rack is the one casting the shadow. She develops a conclusion that that must be the evil man, and she removes the trigger, and in doing so, validates her mother's feelings and then offers reassurance. And by doing this, there's a tremendous response because you get a calmer environment, a calmer mother, and the night moves on in a calmer way. So there's peace all around. Here are some general tips for dealing with delusions and hallucinations. Number one, always assume behavior has meaning. So if mother is running out and she looks fearful, the fear is genuine. Whether or not the trigger seems reasonable to us is irrelevant. She's afraid. Number two, Respond with patience and remain calm. Number three, as we saw in the scenario, identify and remove potential triggers. For example, the thing that casted the shadow. Also, be aware 
of um, windows that create reflections, mirrors and televisions. All of these can certainly trigger maybe not a hallucination, but an illusion. And in other words, the item is there, but it's being misinterpreted by the brain. Number four, offer reassurance. Number five, use humor, model confidence, and rely on positivity. That really gets translated no matter what level of brain damage there is. It gets translated by the loved one as a sense of everything's going to be okay. So now we're ready for the second scenario. And just as I did with the first, we'll talk about a common response to a common behavior, and then we'll follow with an application of the acrostic, and then we'll look at the new and improved um, scenario. So in the second scenario, we're going to see a common behavior to a common, uh, uh, common reaction to a common uh, uh, problem, and that would be refusal to take medication. I'm going to narrate this scenario for you. So here we see the caregiver attempting to give her grandmother medication. Now, this regimen is important because it includes high blood pressure medication and diabetes medication. And as all of you probably are aware, especially those of you who have loved ones who are taking important medication, the consequences of not taking that med medication could be dire. So this grandma, this granddaughter, as you can imagine, is feeling uh, pressured to make sure this medication is taken. But as the granddaughter in this scenario tries to encourage her grandmother to take the medication, grandmother responds, I don't need pills. For what? Who says I need pills? and swats the cup to the floor. The caregiver is beyond exasperated and says out loud, why do we have to go through this every day? I give up and walks away. So let's apply the acrostic to this scenario. And we're gonna first remember, identify the behavior. So what's happening? And then we're going to think about the next part of this acrostic, which is explore the behavior and explore the meaning behind the behavior, and especially what does it mean to this particular person. And then the A part of the acrostic, how would you respond? How would you adjust the environment? So first, when we apply this acrostic, let's identify the behavior. In this particular scenario, Grandmother will not take the pills. So we know this is a problem because the pills are not optional. We can't just say, okay, no problem, you don't need to take them. She needs them to prevent complications which, which could potentially land her in the hospital, right? And this problem, we can imagine, has persisted for a long time because the caregiver actually tells us that. Why does this have to happen every day? So we're getting a repeated behavior here. Second, we're going to explore the meaning behind the behavior. And we're going to look at this through the eyes of the grandmother. Right away, we're going to see two things that are probably contributing to this problem. First, if you remember the image that I showed you, there's nonverbal communication going on here. Granddaughter is towering over her grandmother and really effectively cornering her grandmother. Did you see that? Grandmother's in the couch. She's pretty much sinking into that cushion and granddaughter is standing over her. Well, that's gonna put any living creature in a position of wanting to fight back. And so grandmother may not remember the reason for the pills, but she's certainly gonna be suspicious and feel defensive simply with that nonverbal language. Um, the other thing might be she may not remember that there's a reason for taking these pills, and so she might feel suspicious of why the granddaughter is uh, so invested in making sure she takes them. There might be other reasons. Maybe grandmother remembers feelings associated with the pills, like she can't swallow them or she gets stomach aches, even though she may not remember taking them the day before, right?
or in this scenario, maybe she hasn't taken them for a while. So when we get to the adjustment about what can be done, we want to figure out what can we adjust in the environment and what can we adjust in our environment. Uh, excuse me, what can we adjust in our own uh, response? The easiest adjustment, I think, initially, right away, that we can see is um, eliminating that power differential. So we might want to get the caregiver to sit down instead of towering over her grandmother. Also, you want to remember that if there is an authority figure to that grandmother deeply respects and wants to please, enlisting that authority figure might help to transcend this resistance. And finally, you always want to remember to pair the desired behavior with a positive association. So like I was saying before, if grandmother is associating a stomach ache or difficulty swallowing or this negative interaction with pill taking, it's highly likely she's not going to be taking pills tomorrow. But if there's something positive associated with pill taking, she's going to repeat that behavior. At least there's a higher likelihood of doing so. So let's apply this in an improved response. In this improved response, granddaughter becomes aware of the nonverbal communication and eliminates the power differential by sitting down. So do you see that image? She's sitting down next to grandmother. There's no threat. There's no um, uh, nonverbal communication, which is making grandmother feel defensive. Right away, we've eliminated that. Number two, granddaughter enlists an authority figure that grandmother respects. So in this scenario, can you see the granddaughter is showing grandmother a letter? And in her hand, she's pointing to the letter. She's repeating what this letter says. So this is a letter, she says, granddaughter says, from the doctor saying, I want my patient to take this medication. Now, this letter doesn't necessarily need to be written by the doctor, right? As long as grandmother respects this person, it may be that this ingenious granddaughter wrote the letter herself. But because she knows that granddaughter respects the doctor, she can pair this up with a desired behavior and have a higher likelihood that grand, grandmother will follow the doctor's advice. The final suggestion is to pair the task with a positive um, association. So for example, taking a walk, um, feeding, uh, uh, offering the pill along with lunch or a special treat. Those associations routinely over time, day after day after day, are going to um, produce a higher likelihood of compliance in the future. So here are some tips that are uh, just tips in general for medication refusal. The first, as we saw before, sit down next to the person incorporate pill taking as part of a routine. So if you're having lunch and you have pill taking that's part of the lunchtime routine, that routine is going to take place over time, day after day after day, and there's a higher likelihood that your loved one is going to incorporate that routine and not resist each time. Number three, it's important to remain patient and calm. The more you are patient, the less you show your frustration, the more likely it is that you're not going to associate a negative with a desired behavior. And therefore, um, when there's a positive calm that's associated with the desired behavior, the likelihood of repeating that behavior is higher. Fourth, you want to enlist an authority that your loved one wants to please. It may not be a doctor. It may be a sister, a daughter, a granddaughter, a husband, anybody that your loved one seems to love and respect and want to please can be helpful in situations like this. Again, don't take it personally. If another person works and, and your method doesn't, it's okay as long as we get to the desired outcome. 
Number five, give the most important medications first. And this is because, you know, in this scenario, the antihypertensives, the anti-diabetic medication, those are life-sustaining. Vitamin B, a multivitamin, if we skip it one day, it's not going to be devastating. So try to get those important medications first. And then if your loved one loses interest or resists, it's okay. You can let those go. Um, number six, consider liquid forms or crushing pills. But I would say always consult with your pharmacist first because there's a lot of medications such as extended release that you don't want to crush. Your loved one shouldn't be getting those in one sitting. Uh, so you always want to check with the doctor first before you crush. And, you know, there might even be an alternative, uh, alternative route that can be administered. And then if the doctor says that they can be crushed, always use a small portion of pudding or something sweet or uh, desirable. Uh, I would recommend against mixing crushed medications in large bowls of applesauce or large bowls of pudding because you never know how much is going to go down before your loved one might lose interest in the food itself. So just a word about the scenarios you just reviewed. These scenarios are taken from a whole series of videos offered on this particular website that you see at the top of this page, um, www.dementia.uclahealth.org. And when you get to that website, you're going to see a drop-down menu for caregivers with educational videos. There's 19 different scenarios, starting with a common response, and then there's a discussion about what went wrong, what could be improved, followed by this improved response. These are fantastic as far as resources. And if, even if you don't see your uh, particular challenging area here, you can watch one of these videos. There's some general rules of thumb that can be uh, applied to scenarios that are going on in your life. Also, if you look toward the bottom of your screen, you're going to see our helpline number, 844-435-7259. And even our website, www.altsoc.org. You are welcome to use those resources if you have any questions or concerns, or if you need some referrals, or even some words of advice, words of encouragement. Um, that helpline is open five days a week during business hours, but you can always leave a message if you get in uh, beyond business hours. Okay. Before I, is, is it okay, Kim, if I give them yes, some information absolutely. about the study and then we'll just wrap it up and we'll go on to questions and we're at 11 o'clock, so we have some plenty of time to discuss. So before I move on, I just want to, um, invite you to a special study that I'm conducting on stress and resiliency among dementia caregivers. Um, there's no obligation to participate in the study. I just would be so deeply honored if you would be interested. Uh, this is a study about caregivers. It's about you. Um, please feel free to leave me a message with your phone number, or you can email me with your phone number and address, and I'll send you out some questionnaires. Again, it's not uh, obligatory. It's a voluntary study, but I, I would be so grateful if you would participate. And just one more reminder for your journey. I want you to fuel up, grab joy and abundance wherever you can, and take a deep breath. And remember that Alzheimer's Orange County is here to walk that journey with you. You're not alone. Thank you for spending time with me and with Kim. And have a great, great day. We're going to move on to questions and uh, just see if we can kind of answer, answer some things in particular that maybe we didn't get to in this particular um, webinar. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Galindo. And while you were uh, presenting uh, your excellent uh, presentation, there were a number of questions coming into the chat box. So we'll go ahead and get started with some of them. Uh, one, of our list or one of our listeners has asked, if uh, removing items from the room of a loved one is, if, if you're going to remove items that are causing hallucinations, 
uh, and your loved one becomes upset about the removal of those items as well, do you want to try to redirect or replace, or do you want to replace the item? So I, mm. I, I do you understand that was a little bit disjointed? Yeah, yeah, that sounds okay. actually that's um that's a typical question that a lot of people have. So it's a great question. Um, and if I could re rephrase it, it's mm -hmm. in that scenario that we saw, that first scenario of hallucinations, what if we removed an item and it actually made the person feel worse, not better? And so maybe I could give my input and Kim, you might have some ideas too and we can see if we can uh, address this question. So as we um, may not have emphasized, dementia, is different for different people and it's different day to day. So one of the things we all have to keep in mind is what might work for one person doesn't necessarily work for another and what might work today might not work tomorrow. But let's imagine that that particular loved one in that scenario one day was overjoyed that the evil man was taken out of the room but the next got very upset because now the hat rack is gone or the coat rack. What do you do? Well, my thought is the first thing is definitely um, you want to take that into account. If somebody is getting more upset than not, um, that's meaningful. Don't try to force fit your response to uh, you know what you want to do. It's what's going to make the situation better. So two things you might want to try. One is um, don't necessarily make a big production of removing the item if it's going to cause stress. Try to do it in, an, um, in a very delicate way, in a discreet way, maybe while they're looking someplace else, maybe while they're not even in the room. So you want to figure out a way that it's very, very discreet. And the second thing is maybe there is a way to adjust things so that the item still remains, but it's in a different location, or there's a different way to eliminate that shadow, um, or there might be a way to redirect altogether that maybe it was upsetting in the moment, but um, when redirected, the person is able to kind of forget the initial upset and move on. Kim, what, what kind of thoughts do you have about this? Yeah, I don't think there's much I would add to that other than to just reinforce the notion that um, most folks with dementia don't do well with change. And yeah. so, moving things around in their presence yes. can be stressful. And so I like the idea of uh, waiting till they sort of turn away and look yes. in the other direction. I think that works well. So um, yes. yeah, I think you addressed that perfectly. Perfect, good. Yeah, so let's move on to the next one. Um, I agree that all behaviors have meaning. However, I have struggled at times with patients who have pre-existing mental health diagnoses along with a progression of their dementia. Okay, so we're talking about a dual diagnosis mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. Do you have any pointers in distinguishing behaviors that may be related to psychiatric conditions versus a dementia-related behavior. So there's another mm -hmm. excellent question for you, Dr. Galindo, yes, especially as a, in your role as a psychologist. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, and you know, I get this question a lot in the live classes that we do over at Alzheimer's Orange County. What is the difference between this mental illness and dementia? And what if a person with a pre-existing mental illness then develops dementia or vice versa? They have dementia. How do you know if what you're seeing is a psychiatric condition or is it just part of dementia? Mm -hmm. the, the challenge with this is technically speaking, there is a difference. You know, one is a psychiatric condition, the mental illness, and one is a neurological condition, dementia. However, there's so much overlap. Dementia oftentimes has psychiatric aspects. We talked about one of them here, hallucinations. Um, but there's also delusions, there's times and seasons of paranoia, aggression, um, that out of touch with reality where somebody's saying, you know, I see an evil man in my room and we walk in and there is no evil man. So there are psychiatric aspects of dementia. 
where I think it becomes really important where, where your question is so, so critical is sometimes there might be some things that are um, not in the best interest of your loved one that are psychiatric really, psychiatrically related, like depression, that can be treated even with a medication, possibly, or behavioral interventions. And once that's treated, there's a lifting of mood that really helps with the symptomatology that you see in dementia. Also, sometimes you see an obsessive compulsive, um, almost like quality or disorder that's overlapping the dementia. And if that becomes destructive to your loved one, like for example, repeated hand washing that's resulting in pain and, and um, 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 destruction to the skin and things that are hurtful, or compromise the safety of your loved one, you really do want to talk to your medical professional to see if there's something else that can be done to address that. Because that's not necessarily something that's common with um, most people with dementia. So you want to keep an eye on that. So I guess if I could rephrase that, there are certain aspects that distinguish both mental illness and, and dementia, but then there are things that overlap and and um, the the fine line that you want to pay attention to is is this compromising the health and safety of my loved one? Is this now an issue of my um, loved one is a danger to self or a danger to others, or is this simply part of dementia that I'm going to have to manage? And really, there's no harm in getting a consultation with an expert or your medical professional who has, uh, who can kind of ferret all that out. Um, but other than that, there are things that, you know, the other distinguishing factors, there would be no way we could necessarily see on the outside because they're brain involved. Kim, do you have any thoughts to contribute to that area? It's such a rich and complex topic. Mm, yeah, I, I guess, of course, I'm not a doctor. Um, and I'm not a therapist or a clinician, but I would just want to be sure that any type of excess disability apart from that surrounds the dementia, any of that be mm -hmm. treated as well as possible just yes. to help that person function as well as possible. So, yeah. I mean, that would just always be my goal to just make sure everything that can possibly be treated, be treated. You know, you had yes. mentioned the depression. Yeah. Um, you know, I think a lot of people assume that, well, of course they're depressed, they have dementia, but you know, anything that can possibly be treated, let's get it treated so that that person can live as well as, yeah. as possible with their dementia. So. Yeah, and you know, another thing that comes to mind um, is that it is true, the research would say that people with a pre-existing mental illness, like depression in particular, or schizophrenia, mm -hmm. are at increased risk of developing dementia. So there are some brain issues going on in there. But like Kim was saying, um, we don't necessarily need to assume that everything that we're seeing in dementia, we have to simply say, oh, well, that's just part of dementia. Mm -hmm. There are certain things that can actually receive a different form of treatment, even medically, um, that can take that kind of lift that dark cloud or, or um, interfere with some of the obsessive compulsive aspects mm -hmm. or even minimize the paranoia so that this person is able to function better with the brain they have. So um, the beauty of living in the 21st century is that we do have all these uh, potential areas of help, even though there isn't a cure for dementia. There are some things that we can kind of, you know, some tools that we can right. kind of borrow from that'll help this journey be less stressful and less um, have less impact on safety. Mm -hmm. But again, as I emphasize, there are certain aspects that are just not compromising uh, your loved one's safety. Um, and I can give you a quick example since we have a little bit of time. My, my dad 
uh, we mentioned it before on the first slide, had a um, an auditory hallucination, but it wasn't a harmful one. He could hear, it was very specific, um, a Russian male Orthodox choir singing in the next room. And so that auditory hallucination brought him a lot of joy. And so that hallucination isn't going to necessarily compromise his health or their safety. And that's why I say that's the dividing line. But if your loved one is hearing voices, command hallucinations that are telling him to hurt himself or hurt somebody else, that is something that would compromise his health or safety or even compromise yours. And that would be a time that you say, you know what? I have to make an administrative decision. I have to take this person to visit with a medical professional, see if we there's something, maybe uh, medication or something otherwise that can keep my loved one safe and me safe as well. Wouldn't you agree, Kim? Absolutely. Great yeah. use of examples there. Um, let's go on to the next question. I think it's a, a it's a great one, especially for people who are a little bit new to the field or new to, to family caregiving. How would you respond to your loved one who repeatedly asks for a family member who has passed away? Oh my gosh, yes. And this yep. is this again is not unusual. Um, so and and it may not be about a loved one has passed away. It might be about your uh, brother or your husband, when is he coming home from work? And you get the same question over and over. The one that makes this um, upsetting to most people is that you feel like in telling the truth that you're you're making this person sad every single time because they re re they forget what you said just a little while ago about this person. So when your loved one is repeatedly asking for the family member who passed away, your temptation is to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth and say, well, they died 16 years ago. And then you watch your loved one go into a profound grief. And, and then they, you know, that memory fades and then they ask you again and you're thinking, oh my gosh, here we go again. I would say this is a good time to introduce everybody, Kim, to this concept that we know so well here at Alternative yes. County called therapeutic fibbing. And this is when we recognize that we as caregivers are called upon to bring a greater truth, which is to take care of this loved one's well-being and overall experience of the world to enhance joy, to enhance peace, to minimize anxiety and insecurity and pain as much as possible. And therapeutic fibbing involves not always telling the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Because, so Dr. Galinda, I'm yeah. going to need you to write that explanation down yes. because it's the best explanation I've ever heard of okay. therapeutic fibbing and I need it engraved okay. somewhere so that all caregivers can really yeah. appreciate how important this concept is. Yes. Oh, so, yes. yes. Sorry to interrupt, but it's so important. It really is. It because is. You're you get a better outcome when you adhere to this. You really do. You get the outcome that you need for your loved one, which is to to be happy and See, satisfied. That's, mm -hmm. that's right. And and we we have to remember that they have brain deficits that don't help them. Uh, the brain is not able to explain to the feeling centers of the brain what this all means and what to do with these feelings. So we're leaving them with a big burden that they're un unequipped to handle. So um, it is okay to say so-and-so is not here today. You know, you, you can, there's ways to say something without necessarily going into the gory details. The, the other thing too is there's also a way to break that repetitive cycle of, you know, repeated questioning by diverting attention, by redirecting attention, focusing on something else, like saying, so-and-so is not here today. Let's look at pictures of so-and-so. Let's talk about so-and-so. Um, that's helpful. Let's look at videos of so-and-so. 
So you divert the attention from potential sadness onto something that brings great meaning and joy, which I think ultimately that becomes the goal of the day is just as much joy as possible, minimize pain, minimize anxiety. And if you succeed in those areas, the rest of it is just, you know, it doesn't matter in the long run. Absolutely. Um, I think we have time for just a couple more questions. Sure. Um, how do you respond to behaviors that include missing items mm. and beliefs that they are victims of theft? So this is a tricky one because one thing may not work for uh, two people <laughs> with dementia. <laughs> and so I might give you, oh, this is great. This worked for so-and-so. And then you find it doesn't work for you. And so I'm going to give you kind of the overarching principles. And I want you to remember some of these scenarios we saw today, as well as, you know, take advantage of the videos that, that I gave you that link to. The tricky part about this is there may be a season, and, you know, oftentimes there is a season of paranoia where the person doesn't necessarily remember where they're putting the items, and you're the first person in the line of fire. And so they're going to blame you. Or they might say that there are people coming in the middle of the night taking their stuff um, and nothing you say to offer reason and logic is getting through because we remember their brain in that area is compromised. They can't use rational ideas and logical ideas to explain these things to themselves. All they know is they've got this overwhelming sense of fear. So some people have actually, like we saw in the scenarios before, enlisted an authority figure to alleviate those concerns. Um, and that might be either a letter or an email from officer-friendly so-and-so, somebody neighbor down the street who can do you a really big favor, who says that this problem is handled, we are watching your house, we're taking good care of you, something that will alleviate that fear. But again, you have to find an authority figure who's gonna be convincing enough. And the other possibility is that, um, that there are some items that can be uh, repeatedly referred to that take away that fear. The, the thing that doesn't work is to address this with reason and logic or to get defensive. Like if you're accused of taking the clothes in their, um, in their closet, it doesn't help to say, no, I didn't. Those aren't my clothes. I don't like those clothes. Those aren't my size. It doesn't work. It just causes anxiety. It causes distress. It causes a fight. So it, it really requires using those techniques that we talked about today, or even if you want to look at those videos that I gave you to see if you can piece together some clever ideas for the scenario you have. Kim, maybe you have an example that you've experienced yourself. I can think of one as well if we have time, but I want to give you a little bit of time mm -hmm. to give some insights of your own. Um, well, I think whether we're talking about uh, missing items or, you know, any any particular behavior that we witness an important step to remember is just validating that behavior yeah. and yeah. just paying attention to the emotions that we're seeing with our yeah. loved ones because let's face it if you think your wallet is stolen you're worried and you're yes. anxious and you're fearful so the first thing i would want to do is address that and just say oh my gosh that's that's scary i'm so sorry let me help you look for that um, yes. You know, just I, I think that would be the only thing I would add, Dr. G, just, just addressing that that anxiety and just validating that concern. That actually goes a long way to say, um, boy, that must be scary. I'm so sorry. Let me help you. Mm -hmm. In fact, sometimes if you're blamed and you say, I'm so sorry, will you forgive me? Mm -hmm. That goes miles in reducing and de-escalating that anxiety and tension and even aggression. So, it, you know, empathy is is kind of a um, one of the biggest tools that I found is helpful in a lot of different scenarios, regardless of who I was talking to. It really seemed to um, 
do some magic. Have you found that to be true as well, Kim? That empathy absolutely. factor? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Because, mm -hmm. you know, and above all else, we have to remember that we're dealing with a person who has brain damage and they're yeah. losing control of themselves, of their environment. And, yeah. oh my gosh, how terrifying is that? Yes. And so, um, you know, I, I think especially with these missing items, I, I, I see people who are, it, it, particularly in the early stages, they, it's like they know that they're losing control. So yeah. they are even like hiding things sometimes yes. just to sort of try to keep them safe. And then, of course, yes. they promptly forget where they've put things. And then yes. it's even worse. It all becomes compounded. And so mm -hmm. they just get very panicky. And so the thing we need to do is just calm them and say, oh, my gosh, let's just take a deep breath and um yeah, look at the screen. Yeah. When you're overwhelmed, take a yes. deep breath yes. and then let's look for that together. It, it's yes. scary. It's very scary. Yes. So we need to really um, recognize that. Um, and one so, one quick additional sentence, like we said before, if it crosses that line where it becomes a danger or it is threatening the health and safety of your loved one, Mm -hmm. uh, again, that psychiatric element of paranoia, then you, you, you're you not um, going overboard by asking your doctor if there's something that might help alleviate it, because it is very, right. very scary. So you just have to use your judgment as far as has that crossed that line yet of um, being, a, being an issue. Yeah, and are you talking about medications now, Dr. G? Um, it that would be something you would want to consult with your doctor yeah. about whether or not yeah. there's something could help in that area um, because it's different for different people. It, it sure. really is a uniquely um, dependent on the circumstances and that particular's yeah. that particular person's uh, needs. Yeah. I think about that all the time because over mm -hmm. the years, you know, I've watched different clients and it's like we always want to manage um, behaviors mm -hmm. socially, you know, with these inter mm -hmm. these very interventions we've been talking mm -hmm. about today. But then I do see people sometimes that are just, they become so agitated that they're just so uncomfortable in their own skin. And, mm -hmm. you know, for those folks, I, you know, sometimes see maybe these are the exception where they might mm -hmm. benefit from a yes. little medication to calm them. It's just such Absolutely. an individual thing, isn't it? It requires really a uh, comprehensive assessment and expert mm -hmm. opinion, all of those things. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but certainly, certainly we want people to consider those social interventions first. So I think that the, inform the information that you've given today has just been so invaluable and, um, uh, you know, as always, we thank you so much for the work that you do with our caregivers uh, in person on a monthly basis uh, here at Alzheimer's Orange County. For our family caregivers who are still on the line, I encourage you to learn more about uh, the classes that Dr. Galindo teaches here at Alzheimer's Orange County. And um, yeah, we're just so thankful. This has just been a great, great session. And as we end, I want to thank our sponsors once again, Chatterton and Associates, the Wealth Management Team, O'Connor Mortuary, um, Alzheimer's Orange County, Care Choices, Hospice and Palliative Services, as well as com uh, Caring Companions at Home. Mm -hmm. We will be uh, having our monthly webinar next month, and the topic will be another great topic enhancing everyday activities in dementia care and the speaker will be me Kim Bailey so <laughs> that will be happening on Wednesday November 13th at 1130 a.m. so uh, this brings us to the end of our webinar and uh, good day to everyone and thank you again for tuning in have a great day take care bye-bye